My name is Lucia Moritz, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the conference tonight. And on behalf of Sue Hale, Matthew, and I, I want to officially welcome you to the 11th Annual Alumni of Color Conference. <laughs> Never in a million years did I ever think that I would be at Harvard, let alone being part of such an amazing conference and a group of people. So I'm going to share a little bit about myself to give you a sense of how I got to be here tonight. My stepfather struggled with drug, drug addiction my entire childhood. He was often jobless, and my mother became the breadwinner, making 13000 a year. I was a kid who showed up to school in the hand-me-down clothes and the one pair of shoes. When I was 13, my mom bought me a black pair of shoes, and they were expected to last me the entire year. By the end of the year, my shoes were so worn out that I would color on them with black marker to hide the scuff marks. The worst part, though, was the fear. If anyone has known someone struggling with drug addiction, they know how unpredictable that person's behavior can be. I was scared to come home from school each day because I never knew what mood I would find my stepfather in. My mother, she tried to leave him several times, and more than once, I came home from school to find our car packed up with all our belongings, and my mom saying, we need to leave before he finds out. But she always went back, saying this time he would change, but he never did. School was my escape. I loved learning. And I would dream about becoming an archaeologist and exploring the ancient tombs of Egypt until I read about King Tut's curse and <laughs> decided archaeology was maybe too risky of a field to be in. I would read for hours, escaping to a reality that was so different than my own. And even better, I was good at school. So despite attending some of the worst public schools in California and having teachers who told me kids like me don't go to college, I went. But so many of my peers didn't make it there with me. And I became a teacher because all children, no matter what their background, deserve a quality education and somebody who believes in them. And I loved teaching. But I quickly became frustrated by the people at the top making the decisions that impacted the daily lives of our children that I worked with by people who had never experienced what it felt like to sit inside a failing public school. I wanted my voice in the decision-making process, and I decided to enter the Doctorate in Educational Leadership Program here at Harvard. Now, something brought every one of you here to the Alumni of Color Conference on a Friday night. Maybe you've experienced a teacher telling you that you would never amount to anything. Maybe you experienced a teacher who told you you could accomplish anything that you put your mind to. For me, it was my pastor. He showed me a college application and said, you're going to college. Maybe you've worked with students who had their own dreams of becoming an archaeologist or a doctor or a lawyer. Maybe you were overwhelmed by the amount of obstacles they face in accomplishing those dreams, yet amazed by their ability to flourish despite it all. We wouldn't be here tonight if we didn't have hope and a profound belief that we could change the educational system. If you met me a year and a half ago, you would never imagine that I would be speaking in front of hundreds of students here tonight. When I first came to Harvard, I felt uprooted from my community, out of place, unsure of myself, and more often than not, I chose not to raise my hand in class because I was afraid I wouldn't sound articulate enough. Sitting in classrooms looking at data that shows that low-income students have an average smaller vocabularies than their middle-class peers produced feelings of anxiety. I am that low-income student, and will I prove these researchers right with my words? Here I was wanting a voice in the decision-making process, and I had lost my voice. My first week here, I was sitting in a workshop with Marshall Gantz, a professor from Harvard Kennedy School, and he asked me, who are you? Why are you here? And it was the first time that I told my story instead of others trying to define it for me. Through telling my narrative, I tapped into a source of power within myself that I didn't even know existed, and a power not to be used solely for myself, but for the strengthening of the community. Last night, a current student here, a Latina I respect greatly, told me how much it meant to her to see another Latina speak and welcome people to this conference. As I look around the room tonight, I see the power of the individuals in the room. When one of us is strong, it makes the collective stronger. I see the power of the collective here tonight. The revolution is live right now in this room. This conference itself is possible because individuals leverage their strengths on behalf of the community to fundamentally change the space here at Hugsy and beyond over the course of the past 11 years. Last week, I was sitting on our final planning meeting for this conference. What started off as Matthew Suhail and I bouncing ideas off of each other in the beginning of the year turned into a community of 40-plus individuals. At the end of the meeting, George, 
a local high school student who I met la at last year's conference, and he's facilitating a workshop at this conference, he came up to me and said, thank you for opening up the space for me to be here tonight. Right now, as we're sitting here, millions of students with hopes and aspirations are coming home from schools that systematically make it almost impossible for them to realize their full potential. And they're gonna go back to those schools on Monday. We have the ability to change that and can start right now. Sit down with a young person and make a concrete plan of how you can continue to collectively work together beyond the two days of this conference to pass on our strengths to future generations. My ask is for you to leverage your strengths and resources for the betterment of the community here and your community back home to transform the educational space and in essence, the lives of young people and communities everywhere. I want to thank you for coming to the conference and to kick it off I want to introduce a singing group called Teen Empowerment their mission the mission of Teen Empowerment is to empower youth and adults as agents of positive individual institutional and social change they are performing two songs down in the hood and your voice your choice How's everybody doing? So before we start, we'd like to thank AOCC for having Teen Empowerment to come do inspirational music for y'all. So I mean, I know I like this, this song, so I hope y'all do too. Thank you. Is this working actually? Okay. I can hear it. Could it be this money that put people through this struggle? I'm on the bus and I don't trust nobody in my vision. I'm tripping and hustling. The point of why we live in my mission. To be a mystery to me too, me too. I remember just to walk the streets too. Evil, looking in it's hurting all these people. Try talking to these gangsters, but I swear I'm speaking Hebrew. He who thinking that he better is possessions. Give it a rest, cause all that bragging people do when it's only building up stress. I respect to progressive, everybody is vexed. So much drama in them schools over drugs, money, and sex. Yes, the youth is here and we watch. Than ever. never, murder storms in yet, we survive in the weather A product of pressure, forcing us to strive who is better Crying on the inside, I wish my eyes would get wetter But I'm through, with all this hatred and pain, it makes me insane I'm not about my phone, I feel we underestimated down in the hood We purposely investigated down in the hood Police supposed to come and save us down in the hood It seems like they all hate us down in the hood Stores is doubled up down in the hood These choppers never shutting up down in the hood Violence came and flooded us down in the hood I pray to God that all my loved ones won't drown in the hood huh? Power hungry animals devour the weak And rule the strongest We've been slaves for the longest But in the 21st century It has been mentally So you know where to get started The power is in healing yourself You blame others for your problems Instead of going deep within the self A conflict on the inside manifests on the out In certain life situations you see It's kind of like a drought your mind needs the water, the water is the knowledge and all we get is poison now, somehow we have to block it We need to come together now, and let the real in Instead of getting hunted down, and getting reeled in I'm a fish out of water, man, I can't breathe Because the vision that you can't see Was the water that surrounded me You're telling me to breathe, but the air is was drowning me I we underestimated down in the hood We purposely investigated down in the hood Police supposed to come and save us down in the hood like they all hate us down in the hood These liquor stores is doubled up down in the hood These travels never shutting up down in the hood Violence 
love came and flooded us down in the hood. I pray to God that all my love ones will drown in the hood. I feel we underestimated down in the hood. We purposely investigated down in the hood. Police supposed to come and save us down in the hood. They seem like they all hate us down in the hood. These liquor stores are doubled up down in the hood. These choppers never shutting up down in the hood. Pilots came and flooded us down in the hood. I pray to God that all my love ones will drown in the hood. Uh, yeah. Thank you for having us today. Uh, we are a teen empowerment from Boston, uh, Dorchester in particular. We have a whole bunch of great youth uh, that we are able to work with on a daily. And uh, we work hard to basically express ourselves through art and music in particular. But here's some music for you that we came up with uh, when we first came together. All right? Enjoy. Living in the modern day Rome, yet it's home. I strive for success, my ambitions head on. With devilish temptations running through the brain, I stay sane and grip my reins and digress my pains. Stay in your lane, man. I put the woman up above. Constantly mistreated, she flies away like a dove. Not trusting a soul, so question where's the love? One question, where's the love? Your choice, your voice will make a change. There's no need to be afraid, be afraid. Your voice, your choice will be the change. Come together and break the change. We may look different, but we're all the same. The same, the same. We may look different, but we're all the same. All the misery is there anybody feeling me i'm saying we're trapped in this life there's no light and if you're feeling me then stand up for what's right there's a fight it's the silence that's killing me we're all gonna lose if you're stuck and confused hey yo make your own path watch the road that you choose because there's snakes in the grass and they watching your moves if you mess up and slip there's no door of the blues they didn't make life my brother life is what you make it they don't give you the knowledge well i guess you gotta take it you have to make it in this cold world Till you wake up and realize it's your world With nothing in way now Homie, can't you see you get the message in the signs Pay attention, it's for free You see the life we live every day is an obstacle Hold your head and maintain Cause anything is possible Your choice Your voice will make the change To be afraid Be afraid Be afraid Your voice Your choice will make the change Together and break the chains. We may look different, but we're all the same. The same, the same. We may look different, but we're all the same. The same, the same. We may look different, but we're all the same. Find the best in me, but all my pain arrested me. I'm flipping the script every test that I get when all these haters testing me. Holding in fury and rage, forming the beast to be trapped in a cage. It is ridiculous how I be living with all of this furiousness. I'm amazed, but I keep trying. My people keep dying, but after I pray for more to be saved, I can't understand that no fear for this planet. I feel like hatred made me brave. Most of my worries and most of my tears, family dying like every year. I've been drained, I'm turning insane. It cannot explain why I have no fear. I'll keep riding my way to the top. It's amazing how my flow won't stop. Maybe it's pizza, maybe it's God. You say it's the streets, I'm saying it's not society. Probably because I was violently acting on just mental thoughts. Nah, I'm controlling, so I'm exposing the best of everything I got. Your voice, your voice will be the change. There's no need to be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. Your voice, your choice will be the change. Come together and make the change. We may look different, but we're all the same. The same, the same. We may look different, but we're all the same. The same, the same. We may look different, but we're all the same.
Thank you, Teen Empowerment, for that amazing performance. Uh, thank you, Lucia, for a very moving introduction as well. Uh, hello, my name is Su Yep. Uh, my name is Suhail Sheikh. I'm one of the co-chairs for the 2013 Alumni Color Conference. The revolution will be live. And I have the privilege of introducing our dean, Kathleen McCartney. <laughs> Though this is Dean McCartney's last year with us here at HGSC, her time here has definitely been live. Um, when she was appointed dean in 2006, she was just the fifth uh, female dean in Harvard's history. Just two years ago, she was named the top education innovator in Massachusetts by the Boston Globe. <laughs> Dean, Dean McCartney has been a very long time proponent of AOCC, and no doubt we would not be here today were not for her very generous support. So please join me in welcoming Dean McCartney. I like to support this conference because I look forward to the dancing every year, so <laughs> see you out there tomorrow night. Um, thank you to Teen Empowerment for the uh, wonderful performance. We appreciate it. You have gotten us off to a good start this evening, and I also want to thank Suhail for that great introduction. I can always tell when somebody crafts his own introduction, which you did, so thank you very much. Um, and welcome everyone to this very special Ask With Forum. I want to especially welcome all of our alumni who are returning to campus for the Alumni of Color Conference. And I want to give a special shout out for the co-chairs. I'm Suhail, whom you know. Uh, Lucia, I was also very moved by your words. And where's Matthew Shaw, my dancing partner? He's right there, okay. And thank you to uh, all of you who participated on the AOCC steering committee. I know how much work goes into putting together a conference like this, yes. conference offers our students, faculty, and alumni the opportunity to participate in important discussions about race, class, and education. I just love the theme of this year's conference, The Revolution Will Be Live. Our conference organizers have brought together a slate of transformative leaders, as you'll see from the program. And their question to us is, how can we do more to promote social justice in education? I'm pleased to welcome the first of these thought leaders tonight, Denise Juno, who I've just met, and she's here with her mother from Montana. It's just wonderful. Denise is among those who are returning uh, to Appian Way. She, reserved, she received her uh, master's degree from the Ed School in 1994. Since then, she has held a number of roles in public service. She taught English at Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota. She was the Director of Indian Education at the Montana Office for Public Instruction. And after receiving her JD in 2004, she clerked for two Montana Supreme Court Justices. In 2008, Denise was elected as Montana's State Superintendent of Public Instruction. As a member of the Mandan and Hidatsa, I think I got it right, tribes, Denise is the first American Indian woman elected to a statewide office in the United States. <laughs> Denise's signature initiative as state superintendent has been Graduation Matters Montana, a statewide effort to increase the number of students who graduate high school prepared for college and for careers. Graduation Matters initiatives are locally designed by schools, businesses, and families in order to meet the unique needs of communities. Currently, more than 65% of Montana high school students attend a school participating in Graduation Matters. And the statistics of this program are, are very impressive. Dropout rates have fallen from 5.1 to 4.1%. Graduation rates have risen from 80.7 to 83.9%. And more than 4,000 students have signed a pledge to graduate from high school. Denise's success in raising standards, expectations, and graduation rates in Montana earned her a speaking role at the 2012 Democratic National Convention in Charlotte. We're very proud of that. Her talk this evening is entitled Race, Poverty, Power, and Politics in Our Education System. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Denise Juneau.
thank you for that warm introduction. This is really great to be here. And look at this place. I'm very impressed with the turnout. So great job, Tri Co Chairs. Um, um, TGIF and Happy Sequester Day. Um, <laughs> and I can't believe that you're having me follow teen empowerment. That was really, really good. I feel inadequate now. So don't expect any dancing or singing from me. Um, but thanks uh, for sharing your story as well. And I remember when I was just a student, and when I hear 1994, I'm like, oh my god, I am so old now. Um, but being very quiet, too, and being here for the first time, and you know, coming here from Montana was a long journey in many ways, not just geography. And, and so I learned a lot while I was here, and, uh, and I'm pleased to be back at the institution that has given me so much. Um, Thank the people who helped organize me getting here. It's been seamless, um, the travel and the stay, and, and I just really commend you for all of that. And thanks to the Harvard University Native American program as well. I've had lunch and dinner with them, and it's an awesome group of students. I've had, a, and you know, my mom Carol is here with me. She traveled here with me as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about her later. Um, so, you know, it's just a real honor to be here. And tonight I'm going to talk about a few things. And most of them are going to be based in rural America, because that's what I know, that's where I'm from, and it's often the forgotten America. You know, even here at Harvard we have leadership for urban principalship, and this and that for urban uh, education, all very important. Um, but I think as I go through what we're dealing with in rural America as well, you will see that there are many connections that can be made. The themes are going to be similar. How we approach the work should also be very similar. And so I think it's important to bring these discussions of no matter where we are in our country, that we have a lot of work to do in our public education system, but that we can approach it differently as well. We don't have to follow the rhetoric that's going on in the country right now, that we can fix it from within. Um, so I'm going to talk about three statewide efforts in our Montana public education system. The first, what we are doing with culturally relevant curriculum, or what we call Indian education for all in our state, American Indian integration into every content area of the curriculum. Uh, talk about our initiative to decrease the dropout rate, uh, Graduation Matters Montana. And I will also provide an overview of our work with our lowest performing schools in the state, the ones that uh, are in areas of high poverty. And in our state, that can be found on Indian reservations. And I think that's where you'll see a lot of similarities with all the work and the discussions that happen at this school. And finally, I will give my thoughts on how national policy and politics is leading to discouragement in education and a public mistrust of our schools and those who work in them. How the goals of our American education system, excellence and equity, is seemingly at stake when I think of what the conversation's been, unless we act very soon to save the social compact around economic equality and security, equality of opportunity that we have created together as a country called public education. But there's also always, always hope, always. And that hope does lie with our upcoming leaders, with many of you sitting in this room tonight um, as we get beyond the ideology and the bitterness and get back to the basics of working with educators and other stakeholders to improve our educational outcomes. You know, in keeping with the theme, we need a counter-revolution to what's been going on, to speak against the current rhetoric of bashing teachers and bashing public schools. If we do not raise our voices now, we could lose one of the last truly great public ventures and systems we have in our country and still remains our best hope for the country for our future. I hope that as I go through this, you'll hear how our work in Montana is focused on preserving and working within the public education system, working with communities to confront our challenges, and bringing all stakeholders to the table to inform decisions, sort of going back to the basics, um, which is a revolution now in itself, and amidst all the national talk of what, in parentheses, should be called reform. So I'm just going to give you a little context about our state. Uh, it's very large. It's very rural. Uh, our public education system, it's also very diverse with large schools and small schools. Um, our largest school district in the state 
educates around 16,000 students, and we still have about 41 room schoolhouses dotting our landscape. 70%, 70% of our public school students attend 20% of our schools. So concentrated in what we call urban areas, which to you would be maybe, I don't know, North Boston. Um, <laughs> 46 of, our, of Montana's 56 counties are considered frontier counties with an average population of six or fewer people per square mile. So if you want space, you should come visit our state. <laughs> the density of the state is 6.8 people per square mile. We have less than one public school student per square mile. And to put that into context, um, Connecticut has about 100 public school students per square mile. And you think of the space and the size of the, and the difference of those two states. So we're a rural state. This next, uh, this map shows the expanse of our state. We have seven Indian reservations and one state recognized tribe, the little star in the middle of the state. Uh, my office, the Office of Public Instruction, oversees 821 public schools that educate around 141,600 students. So not even as many as that are just in the Boston School District. Go all over our state. We have great public schools. Our students regularly score in the top 10 in math and reading. They're tied for first place. They tied for first place last year in, on science, on the NAEP. Uh, we do have challenges, of course. We have too high, a too high dropout rate. We have big achievement gaps between American Indian students and white students. American Indian students do drop out of school at three times the rate of white students. And I get to travel in this job. It's really a great job. I love being the superintendent of public instruction. I get to visit schools all across Montana um, and to see teachers doing great work and students learning and I get to hear what's going on day to day and understand how policies and practices are being implemented in local schools. Um, I traveled to this one school one time where there was a fourth grade class going on in arts. You know, arts and education, vital. We need to continue uh, helping to support those efforts. But they were drawing pictures and I got, was walking around and one little girl was drawing this picture. I was like, well, so what are you drawing? And she goes, well, I'm drawing a picture of God. And I said, well, you know, honey, nobody really knows what God looks like. And without even looking up, she said, well, they will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was at, I visited an eighth grade vocabulary class one time and the teacher was in front of the room and she said, you know, students, if you say a word 10 times, it will be yours for life. And from way back in the room, you could hear this little voice going, Amanda, 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 Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to see great things that happen. Um, and as educators, part of our job is to help students understand and respect individual differences in gender, race, culture, religion, class, politics, ability, sexual orientation, and physical appearance. <laughs> We must help them understand that each of us has a life story, like Lucia gave us, um, for, that allow us to view the world from a particular lens, and that each of our stories that we bring to the table is important. So I'm going to start out a little bit telling you a little bit about myself, so you know where my values come from, and from the lens through which I see the world. I'm an enrolled member of the Mandan and Hidatsa tribes, I'm located in North Dakota, my mother's tribes. Uh, and Caesars and Raquel's and students here at Harvard and Jason who works here uh, got to meet over lunch and dinner. Um, however, I grew up in Brownie, Montana, so way up there in the corner on the Blackfeet Reservation, which is my dad's tribe. I graduated from Browning High School. I have an English degree from Montana State University, a master's degree from this great school, and a law degree from the University of Montana. I've been a teacher, an attorney, and I now serve as the state superintendent of public instruction and as you heard earlier, I am the first American Indian woman to serve in a statewide elected position. I bring forward this issue because it's important to understand its context and how meaningful it is to be standing here in front of you. The story of American Indian involvement in the public education and the American political system is a brief one. My great, great grandparents observed the beginning of reservation life in the middle to late 1800s and early 1900s. We often talk about, and I'll talk about Indian education for all in a bit, but you know, the things that you learn in school like westward expansion, you know, we always say, well, we sort of talk about it like an eastern invasion, you know, and it's all perspective and how you present different things. 
Um, but they saw a destruction of their known way of life and had no opportunity, opportunity to attend any education system except a religious mission school here and there. They were on reservations when Montana became a territory and then a state. My great-grandparents attended school at a time when Indians were educated at off-reservation federal government boarding schools hundreds of miles from home or at Bureau of Indian Affairs day schools or at religious mission schools. They could not attend a state public school. My great-grandfather attended school at Carlisle Indian School in Pennsylvania. And so just how far that was. And, and there's just a lot of history that go, goes along with this that still affects American Indian communities today with the mistrust of the public education system and having to build those uh, connections again. It was not until 1935 when some Blackfeet parents sued the state that Indians were even allowed to attend public schools in our state. 1935. My parents were the first generation to attend public schools in our state. My parents are second generation public school students. And still, their first years after high school were spent at Haskell Institute in Kansas in the 1960s during the civil rights era in America at a time when most Americans were fighting for equality. My parents as adults were in a school where they went to town only on the weekends and had lights out at 9 p.m. After graduating from Haskell, my parents went to California on a federal program called Relocation, where they took Indians to the cities and gave them a job in order to assimilate them into Main Street society. Um, so I actually was born in Oakland, California. Um, most of my peers my age, um, American Indians are born in cities as a result of this, and so I always like to tell people I'm the product of a federal policy. Um, my brother and I were the third generation in our family to attend public schools. My grandparents were born before Indians even had the right to vote or were even considered citizens of the United States. It wasn't until 1924 when Congress passed this act that Indians could vote and then only if they were a taxable property owner. It wasn't until 1954 when Indian people could vote whether they were taxable property owners or not. My brother and I are the first generation in our family born with the right to vote simply because we were born U.S. citizens. And that's pretty amazing. Think about that, about really how brief that history is. How fortunate I am to be standing in front of you as a graduate of the Harvard Graduate School of Education and as Montana State Superintendent. And it is all because of education. And of course, much credit goes to my family, my mom and dad, who always believed in me, in me and my brother, and gave us no choice but to become educated. <laughs> Indian Education for All. It's, this has been such an important movement in our state, and it's really a quiet revolution that's happening all across in classrooms all across Montana. Um, the idea that all of our citizens should know and understand the basis and have a factual uh, understanding of the beginnings of our country. And that the fact that there are still over 500 sovereign, sovereign nations within our nation's borders, that each of these domestic dependent nations, as they are called, have their own histories, governments, issues, languages, and cultures, and that there is a political and legal basis for legitimizing their existence that can be found in the founding documents of this country. Declaration of Independence, U.S. Constitution, uh, you take a look and American Indians are mentioned. Um, and I really believe you cannot truly understand our nation's underpinnings, our collective history, or even our current political affairs unless you have an understanding of the relationship of American Indians to the U.S. government. Uh, for example, yesterday, the Violence Against Women Act was reauthorized, and that took some work, so yeah. But there was a provision in the VAWA that said that even though American Indian women, tribal women, are raped more often by non-Indian perpetrators on the reservations, that the jurisdiction issues did not allow tribal courts to prosecute those non-Indian perpetrators. And so the clause in the VAWA was that if a rape happens on the reservation and it's a non-Indian perpetrator that the tribal court could prosecute because a lot of times 
the federal government comes in to prosecute, but they're so overwhelmed with other issues that doesn't happen. And so the re idea that the, the Republicans were fighting against that provision in particular as not passing this act is really something I think that shows us why we need to know about the basis of, of uh, the basics of tribal sovereignty and what that means and how that history plays out. And so you still see it playing out in today's politics and today's policies and issues. And I just think if our congr congressional leaders had learned an accurate history of America and had a basic understanding of tribal sovereignty, there wouldn't be so much fear-based decision-making on issues like the Violence Against Women Act. In Montana, we are making sure that all students receive an education that includes American Indian history, culture, and contemporary issues. And these future state, tribal, and national leaders are going to make better decisions and have better opportunities to work toward justice for all because they will not be scared of the other. They will be able to know that differences exist, talk about those differences, and at the end of the day, look across the table and understand each other better. So I have to just tell you a little bit about how this came about and I brag on our state a little bit and the type of education system we are developing that embraces an accurate history and respects the contemporary lives of American Indian people and tribes. This is the language found in our state constitution that was written in, in 1972. So we're very fortunate. And we are very proud of the work that Montana has done in implementing Indian education for all. Um, however, we know that it did not happen overnight and we certainly are not done. The important thing to know about this language is in 1972, 100 delegates came to Helena to create a new document, a new compact for our state. Um, and although they were visionary and put this language in, there was not one American Indian as a delegate. And so it took non-Indians to really develop this and create a vision for our state. And that's the idea of working together and making sure that everybody understands what's happening. And it took a lot of work from many, many people over many, many years. It took political action, uh, community and statewide advocacy, legislative action, and even legal action. And this is where I want to talk about my mom a little bit. She was the first American Indian state senator in our state. Um, we, at that point, had 10 Indian legislators, and what a difference that makes. And you talk about engagement with politics, that's what happened with this act. We were able, she was able, along with her colleagues, to push a statute that talks about the legislative intent, um, legislative intent of, of that provision in our Constitution that lined out exactly what that meant. Later on, she was able to push for funding. So now schools receive funding, they receive, uh, our state receives funding, but as a result of political power, we were able to get this legislation. And then we were able to hang our hat on something. And even, but although that language was added in 1999, um, not much occurred until there was a school funding lawsuit that went to our state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court basically said it was an equity lawsuit on whether there was uh, enough money that was distributed equally among everybody. And although our Constitution said that the legislature must provide a quality education, there wasn't any definition of quality. So the Supreme Court said, legislature, you need to decide what the, uh, quality is, define it, and then you have to fund that definition. And the Indian education provision was actually included in that lawsuit, and it was, became the strongest piece of the lawsuit. When they came back, they said, the state has shown no defense to implementing Indian education for all. And that was it. And so as a result of that, we were able to get, um, it became part of the statutory definition of what a quality education is. And so now for any school in our state to be saying that, to say that they are providing a quality education, Indian Education for All has to be a part of that, which means they have to be integrating every content area, every curriculum area with an accurate and authentic and valid piece of Indian history, contemporary lives or issues. And so it's been a big movement um, and money made a difference. Political power, a lawsuit and money got us to where we are. And, you know, as I was speaking earlier a little bit at lunch about how we've made such large gains in really a short amount of time. This didn't happen until 2005. We have a group of people at the State Education Agency developing comprehensive professional development system, a multitude of resources, and they're doing their best to carry the message around the state. It's important to know that it, 
we're, we're certainly not done, but I can walk in any school in the state now and they are, students are asking great questions. Our current governor, who has a fifth, third, and first grader, talks about how his children know more about Indians than he ever did going through the entire education system. And when we first started this um, push across our state, we had teachers who were coming in saying, you know, we have money, we had the law, we were developing resources, and they were like, give us the stuff and we'll teach it. And then all of a sudden backed off. It's like, no, we don't know enough. You know, that they went through their K-12 system, they went through college, they went through their teacher education program learning nothing about Indians. And all of a sudden we were at a point in our state saying, here you go, teach about Indians. Um, and so it was, it's been a struggle. But I've watched over the last seven years of how it's grown and people were hungry. Teachers were hungry for this information. They were hungry to have this new way of doing things and this new learning that they had been denied in their education system. And so I can walk in schools and I see accurate information in hallways, I see posters, I see students asking really thoughtful questions. And that's why I talk about the great hope is really with the kindergartens who are entering, uh, the students who are entering kindergarten this year and the type of knowledge they will have as they move their way through the system, um, it's going to be phenomenal. And that really is the revolution that's happening in our state around culturally relevant curriculum. Just show you a couple things. Common Core, we were the last state to adopt it. Um, we like to take our time in Montana and really uh, vet it and make sure that it was a good fit for our state. Uh, uh, and so we did eventually adopt it. I actually came around, I was not uh, in favor of them until I started talking with teachers who were uh, doing things and, and they were the ones who convinced me that it was the right move for us to make. And I think it's actually, this in itself is a revolution. The idea that now we have common standards across 46 states is pretty phenomenal um, and that students can move around. You talk about equity and excellence in our education system, the two twin goals that we have and the idea that now we have these high standards and they're even and they're, uh, you know, should provide equity down the road, I think that's a really good thing for us to at least have that expectation that this is what students should learn. But we were the only state in the country that actually integrated Indian education for all into the standards. And so we still have that, you know, they came out and said you need to have 85% of them and you can only add 15%. I was like, I don't know what that means, so we're just gonna throw these things in there. Um, <laughs> And we're developing companion guides with it now, and so there will be lessons that are tied to all the Common Core that have to do with Indian Education for All, in particularly. Um, these are just a few of our things. You really should visit our website and go to the Indian Education Division. We have probably over 400 lesson plans on there. We have uh, units and resources that go with every content area um, in our schools. A lot of great work's gone into all of these, a lot of teacher sharing ideas now. Um, but these, I think, are important, and these are things I think that anybody, any state, our country could actually do, um, essential understandings. We brought together all the tribes, and so like I talked about earlier, partnerships and working and community, we brought together tribal educators from all our tribes and said, each of you has a unique history, unique culture, you have unique backgrounds, but what is it um, that is in common? What are essential that we can use at a state agency to develop curriculum around and talk about. And they came back with ideas like every tribe has their own unique history. You know, and just even having that, we're not a monolithic group, we're not a monolithic tribe, you know, that everybody has their own history, culture, language. Um, they had, uh, the second one is that there's no generic Indian, that we run on a spectrum everywhere from traditional, people who still practice their culture, all the way to fully assimilated into American society and that along that spectrum, individuals have differences. Um, and just that understanding, I think, is important for people. Uh, and so, you know, just a lot, that history can be observed from a different perspective. I talked a little bit about the Western and westward expansion and Eastern invasion. And so, it's those basic ideas, um, and there are seven of them. And everything that we do goes around these essential understandings. All the, the lesson plans have a connection to them, all our units. These are the essential understandings that everybody needs to know in our state about the American Indian tribes that reside within it. A few years ago, our former governor actually um, put forward $2 million to give to each tribe. Um, you know, I can't go down to Crow Reservation and say this is the Crow history. I'm not Crow, I wouldn't speak for the Crow. 
Um, but what we were able to do is then give this money out to the tribes. They developed their own story. They did it however they wanted to. Some wrote books, some did DVD sets. They created some sort of uh, way to talk about what their tribal history was. And then we were able to take that and put it all together in this document, which sort of brings all of those, issue, all those histories together and then put it out. And so I think this has been really significant too because it's tribal histories told by the tribes themselves, compiled together and then pushed out to teachers and, and to the public. Framework, this is really a great document. Um, and this just provides a framework for schools implementing Indian education for all. It's sort of a how-to guide of how do you do it. What do you do with your policy? What do you do with professional development? What do you do with um, things that are going on in schools? And this is just one example of uh, the units or the resources that we put together. This is really good uh, information about language arts and how to integrate Indian education for all into language arts. And this is our newest one called Birthright, and it's bringing in native poets in to the fold um, around literature and talking about that and really a teaching guide to teach native literature. This is, um, like I said, I can go across the state now and see great things happening. And this is just one voice uh, from educators in the field, a school that probably has two native students in it. Um, that see the benefits of incorporating Indian education for all into various content areas. And we've had the opportunity to hear some amazing success stories about how Indian education for all has transformed classrooms and learning. Um, just a lot of great things that are happening in our state as they're integrating Indian content into curriculum across the board. Um, and then this is from a student who attends a school right off the reservation about the type of learning that's happened for him, an uh, Indian student. These are the voices of our future, um, our students and their perceptions of what Indian education for all means to their learning and their relationships. It's also been great examples of cross-cultural learning, bringing students from off-reservation onto the reservation and creating connections with students so they learn from each other and how, I mean, they are very open about talking about their fears and their biases going into that and how they come out and say, we are all the same. We heard that song earlier, but how we're all very similar and we have similar backgrounds and not being able to be afraid of each other. And then just one story from one of our urban schools where for an Indian student coming into an urban school where they're just one of a handful and sitting in the classroom and not feeling engaged and not feeling empowered to really engage in the classroom and how bringing in guest speakers um, from, the, from a nearby tribe in to talk to the students and how this little fourth grader all of a sudden turned a corner, seeing himself in the classroom, seeing that presentation um, and just the teacher talking about how he turned the corner and what really became engaged all of a sudden and how he picked up the hand drum that she brought into the classroom and sang a song of thanks that that had happened. And now he's one of the leaders in the classroom. And I think those are the significant stories that can happen. And all of you know that. Relevancy is important. Integration and, and understanding our history is important. But this is actually what's going on all across our state in classrooms in 821 schools. And it's a really phenomenal revolution to watch. And this is um, so some of the things we're entering a renaissance of sorts with the inclusion of Montana Indians in our standards, curriculum, and professional development. Tribal voices are being included in classrooms all across Montana. An accurate and authentic history of America and our state is being presented to all students. Our office has created over 300 classroom lessons and units spanning nearly every curricular area. And even our new online high school course delivery system offers a Native American studies class and we have challenges, of course, um, one being integration into our higher education system. There are some efforts, but it seems to be hit or miss, and nothing near what our K-12 system is doing, um, and nothing near what needs to happen. I visit with our teacher education programs in the state and said, we are going to constantly be remediating your teacher candidates as they step out of higher education if you do not integrate Indian education for all into your content as you teach teachers how to teach. Um, and so higher ed needs to step up and help us make sure that this is happening in our state and that's currently not hap happening. In fact, our Board of Regents have created policies to sort of distance themselves from it. Um, 
And so we'll be working on some of that. And our, our next job, I think, is to really work with higher ed and make sure teachers, at least, and all graduates are leaving with some sort of knowledge of Indian education for all. Um, I'll sp speak briefly about this Graduation Matters Montana. It is uh, my big initiative. When I first stepped into office, I saw that there were, you know, we had a challenge in our education system around dropout rates, way too many students dropping out of school. Um, so I knew that we could do better. And so I started Graduation Matters Montana. Uh, I committed staff time to carry out this initiative. We worked hard to get public-private partnerships so we could help seed fund local efforts that are happening. Um, and we are working on making sure that this is all moving forward. And the idea is to increase the rate of students graduating, of course, establish a network of support, create school-based and community-based opportunities um, for students. Our state's seven largest communities, again, urban, um, our urban areas, as we call them, have half the population of students who drop out, and so we really work intensively with them. Again, our Montana Indian students drop out disproportionately to their white peers, and when we look at urban Indians attending our urban schools, they drop out at a higher rate. And so we know the data, and that's what I think all of you work in data and are probably steeped in data, and we have so much data, we're sometimes drowning on it, in it, but it's like, what do we do with that? What do we do with the data that we have, and what kinds of policy can we put around it? I mean, so I started traveling around the state, inviting stakeholders to the table. Schools have really stepped up to the um, plate and helped uh, and committed themselves to really working on this effort. Uh, I'm gonna get to this next part. So I think what you need to know is it's working. We're bringing stakeholders to the table. We have communities coming together, businesses on our website. We have business toolkits. We have community toolkits. We have a lot of information for people who want to start this type of program um, in their school. This is the website. You should go check it out. Also, I'm a big believer in student voice. And so I have a student advisory board that helps come to the state level and advise me on state level policy. These students are students who dropped out of school and dropped back into school, students who were valedictorians of their class. They come from small schools and large schools. In fact, I don't know if Iku's here. Iku Beck is uh, actually a student, a freshman here at Harvard University, and she was on my student advisory board last year. Um, and so they bring some great ideas to me. Um, they tell me when my ideas are lame, too, so <laughs> that's very helpful. But it's always three issues that rise to the top no matter how they talk about it. Structure, they want rules to live by, but they want to know what those rules are, and they want them applied consistently. A lot of times they see these rules in schools, let's, let's say in our state's 10-day school policy, where students who are engaged in sports and activities can miss up to 54 days a year, but they're all school-related excuses. But if another student has a hard life um, and has to make some choices, and doesn't come to school or maybe sick or something happens, they get deemed for that. And so what they want is a framework that has structure. They want to know what the structure is and they want it applied consistently. They want relevance of their curriculum. They want to know that it's going to do something for them. Um, they don't want to be sitting around wasting their time anymore. And they need support. And I think each of us could tell a story of somebody who supported us and one caring adult. And always, no matter where you go, in our state, and I visit with students, it's always, a teacher, a community member, a parent, someone who cared enough to support that student. And I always tell people, like, if it's just, if that's that simple, if it's one caring adult that will help a student get through school, we should be able to do that. We should be able to do that. This is a, I won't go into that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about our work that we're doing around what's called Schools of Promise. And these are, this is work with our lowest performing schools. As I said earlier in, uh, at the beginning, these are schools that are located on our Indian reservations. It's been a demanding initiative. Um, I have high expectations of my staff in this area, uh, all my areas, but this one in particular. Um, they're facing significant challenges, these communities and schools. We're working to transform several of the lowest performing schools in the state under this initiative. And despite our great educational outcomes, as I talked about earlier, we do have a few schools that do need reform. And these are schools, and we've identified a type of poverty. And I think this is really where there's a connection to urban education. We have identified poverty that has four components. It's deep, it's generational, 
it's concentrated, and it's isolated. And you may say, well, isolated doesn't fit urban, but in urban inner cities, you have waves and waves of poor people to go before you get to any wealth. And so it's those four components. And once we know it's that type of poverty, we can put some policy around it, and we can put some programming around it, and make decisions that affect that, because we know it's not just the school, we have to bring in everybody. And it has to be a full court press. And in, uh, in these isolated areas, it's tough because there are no businesses to pull in. There are no Main Street businesses. There are no nonprofit organizations. These are rural areas. And so then how do we approach that? I'll just give you an idea of what this is about. Um, these communities have unemployment rates that hover around 70%, and not just during the recession, but always, always 70%. Many students come to school with heavy loads of emotional trauma. Most students in these schools are not proficient in reading and math. One of our communities on the Crow Reservation has a population of just under 7,000. The homicide rate there is 87.4 per 100,000, more than double the rate in Detroit, 50% higher than the rate in New Orleans. So how does school improvement happen under these circumstances? Do federal policies really get it? And how can we work with these communities to make life outcomes better for the children in these communities? As the leader of the state's public education system, when I stepped into this office, I told people that I will not stand by and let another generation of kids fail. I refuse to let that happen. Our state cannot afford to allow certain communities to languish. The hope for these communities, and indeed for our state and country, will transpire when every child is successfully educated in a quality school. We must work with these schools, their staff, parents, students, and communities to raise academic achievement. Under the Schools of Promise initiative, we developed a close partnership with, this school, with these schools, and it was not easy. Local union members showed tremendous courage and agreed to amend their collective bargaining agreements to work longer hours, more days, and be evaluated on stringent requirements, including student data. School boards had to agree in a couple of schools to replace their long-standing high school principal. Administrators had to agree that things were going to change and that we, as the Office of Public Instruction, would be there to work alongside them on every aspect of this change. Communities had to agree to become more involved and more connected to their school. And so it's not easy work, and there are, in fact, difficulties at every turn. It is, however, vitally important work, and small stories of success are beginning to emerge. And this is just uh, Chief Plenikou. He's a Crow, uh, a Crow Indian, and this was his quote, education is your greatest weapon, with education, you are the white man's equal. Without education, you are his victim, and so shall remain the rest of your lives. And it's very powerful to think about. This is what his message was to the young people in his tribe. My friend and I visit, and we often go to conferences in our respective fields, mine in education and hers being budget policy, and we hear keynotes and attend workshops. And while it's always really good information, we end up leaving asking, but what about the reservations? What about the reservations? And really, what about rural America? Where is rural America in our discussion and, and our discourse? And there are two, these are two issues that aren't focused on. They certainly need attention, and they need attention at our top universities. Federal and national organizations need to take these different contexts into account when discussing education policy, because one size certainly does not fit all. And most education policy is made with large urban schools in mind, and it makes it difficult to make it work in our rural states. For example, how do you work with public schools that are really state islands in the middle of an Indian reservation, places with unique culture and history and its own government, places that have nearly 100% American Indian students, and very high poverty rates. There's not much research that we could rely on when we started down this road. When I became state superintendent, I knew that these schools, of, uh oh, oh, look at that that these schools of promise were capable of providing a quality education. I'm a product of one. Grew up on a Blackfeet reservation. I know it can provide a quality education um, because I ended up here, and, and that's a pretty good foundation for, uh, of education. I know that these communities can come together and support their children and help them achieve greatness, and I know these students on this slide are just as brilliant and just as capable as any other student in our, any of our schools in Montana. And so when I first stepped into office, we started down this road, and then in 2010 is when all the 
school improvement grant money came out, millions of dollars that really helped us jumpstart this effort, but it came with federal strings, and so it was really tough to get going. Um, it gave us a unique opportunity to work with all kinds of different stakeholders, uh, tribal governments, uh, and we were able to build a very unique model for rural, for rural America. Um, we had to negotiate with the federal government a lot and got some wiggle room, not a lot, um, but they didn't allow, allow us to deviate from some of the reform components that they felt were critical and led to a few difficulties. Uh, and we've seen success. We, all of our schools that we've been working with, have, they've seen significant increases in their scores during the time we've been working. Um, students, we pay really close attention to what's happening. Not every success can be measured with data points or with charts and numbers. Uh, for example, I was recently up in, on the Fort Peck Reservation where we have one of the schools and sitting in a restaurant and next to me was a table of women talking about just how much more welcoming the school was and how they didn't feel afraid to walk in there. Those are things you can't measure with test scores and things you can't measure with data points, but important points to understand that the mistrust is being broken down. Um, These are just a few of our other schools. Um, like the one in the corner here, that's the entire graduating class. <laughs> I went and visited them and then they asked me to come back as a graduation speaker. I said, only if all of you graduate. <laughs> so I went back. <laughs> These were just issues and factors that we had to consider. The type of poverty that I talked about a little bit, lack of mental and emotional health supports, lack of expectations of students, um, so these are all the things that we took into account as we were developing this model. Um, mobility rates, very high mobility rate, kids moving around. And actually this comes from Mass Insight and it's the model that we uh, adopted and kind of what we put even around all our state education agency, we put all of our work into this triangle now. Readiness to learn, readiness to teach, and readiness to act. And we spend as a SEA, uh, probably 90% of our time on readiness to teach and not enough time on those other components. And so this is what our model was based on. This is now where our SEA has moved into. This is just our unique approach. I'm getting close to time, so I'm running through it. Um, community meetings, uh, we had a lot of those. And one thing I think that's important to know as I get into this polit political talk in a little bit is we went out with our union. I know there's a lot of discussions about unions in this country right now, but they were a great partner with us. They moved with us. Um, they came out to these communities and worked with their union at the local level to really support it and get, us, get everybody on board. And so we were able to do that. Um, we had a lot of community meetings, like I said. We visited tribal councils. We met with tribal education departments. Met with local Head Start. I like that little guy. He looks kind of crabby in the back. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> We hosted feeds. We just talked a lot with community members about what was coming and if they engaged in this partnership with us, how they could help us move it forward. This is our organization chart. Um, and I'm not going to walk you through it, but it's important to know that in the whole circle area there, we put everything in the culture of community and the tribe. That everything we do approaches it with that sort of eye, no matter what it is that we're working on. Successes and le lessons learned. We have on-site state staff. And so the way the school improvement grant money usually worked is the money would come pouring in. We would identify schools. We'd say, here's your money. Good luck with your reform. This time we kept the money at the state level and we created these partnerships. And we put a transformation leader to work with uh, leadership, an instructional coach to work with teachers. We have a community liaison that we actually had to ask uh, Department of Education to allow us to have and one of my discussions with the department was like we have a president who started his work as a community organizer and you're telling me that there's nothing in here that would allow us to put community organizers on the ground in education and but we are able to get it um, but I needed that argument and school board coaches uh, our school boards are lay people from these communities and so that's provided a real good framework for us as well well um, home visits very important, we've been able to take teachers out into the home where they visit with the parents of their students and the type of knowledge that they've been able to gain and, and the strength that's come from there. Uh, nurses in the school, sc site-based uh, health 
things. Uh, we've had to find our own money at the state level for wraparound services. We're moving into that because these students are coming to school with a lot of emotional trauma every day. And in fact, what we're finding is teachers who are teaching these students on a daily basis sort of get secondary trauma. And so one of our professional development opportunities was to help them self-care so that they have to take care of themselves before they can teach these students who are dealing with daily trauma as well. Um, just going to go through. Just that there's been a lot of attention paid to this model, that it really is a good model for rural America. We've been able to really do a full court press on a lot of areas, making connections with communities, and learned that ourselves at the Office of Public Instruction, we can be nimble in our approach because we've had to make changes very quickly. Um, I'll just tell you one story about Secretary Duncan. He came out to Montana a few years ago and came to Lame Deer and I took him to the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, his first visit to a reservation ever. And there, this is a video you should look it up because he talks a lot about his visit to Northern Cheyenne and about how he had these meetings with students and parents and they were all sitting in a talking circle and how this one kid rose up, um, Teton Magpie is his, his name and he's graduating this year. and he. Uh, spoke truth to power. He got up and he said, Secretary Duncan, what we want is adults in these schools who have high expectations of us, who challenge us, and to keep us accountable. And that's why I tell people, it's like, if that's all it is, we can do that. But how he was so touched by that, Secretary Duncan, and when he goes out and he talks about, and in this video clip, he talks about, if we can't get it together, and I can't make, he himself cannot make a difference in these communities with these children, he will have personally failed. So I like to bring it up all the time. I'm like, you should give us an extension then on our money. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about, and I know time's going, but, um, oh, just one fast story about Secretary Duncan when he came out there. So, like I said, it's rural, and there, were the, there was one area where he, uh, they got out and he was with his staff and they jumped out of these big black SUVs that they were roaring down the road on and came out and there's nobody coming for miles. And they all pull out their blackberries, and there's no cell service. <laughs> so we still have areas like that. Um, where is it? And I started at the beginning about our American education system has two goals, excellence and equity. And like I said earlier, Common Core Standards have started us down this road, providing equal learning goals across all schools and states, and I'm excited about them. However, it's difficult to achieve both equity and excellence at the same time especially in a nation with income inequality as deep and pervasive as it is in the United States. Most of our focus and research and programming about poverty has been geared toward closing achievement gaps in urban areas. In fact, most of the reform efforts seen across the country are designed to affect change in big cities. Um, for example, moving principles around between schools. What if there's only one principle like we have in a lot of our schools? Closing schools. What if there's only one school in a community and the next one is miles and miles and miles away. And it can't absorb a great number of students anyway. Where do the students go? We have severe problems that we ought to act with urgency to solve, but the latest initiatives proposed around the country are actually likely to exacerbate our real challenges, hinder further growth, and undermine life chances for millions of our most vulnerable children. For example, on teacher evaluations, do we really think teachers actually know how to teach much better than they do? and are just holding out for more pay. Most teachers are not afraid of accountability, and of course they need good, unbiased feedback on how they've performed, and I think few would argue with that. Um, but why must that same data drive compensation and retention decisions from a state level? Wouldn't it make more sense to hold school leaders, school leaders accountable for overall performance? Um, to achieve the misguided aims of this particular reform package, unions have been attacked across this country and in many, many states. Never mind, again, that many of the nations that are now outpacing us are completely unionized and that our highest achieving states with some of the most robust, have some of the most robust union protections. And it is possible, as I stated, to work with your unions when you're doing the school improvement work. They can help to get the job done. Picking fights and making the adults pick sides within and about our education system does not help kids. 
I happen to think that working with the unions actually makes reform and improvement efforts easier. At least it's worked for us. Choice. I go on and on about choice, and I am a believer, and I think there's choice out there. Private schools, um, we don't have charter schools in our state, um, and that if parents want to send their student to a school, that's fine. I just don't believe in taking public money to fund any sort of private efforts. Um, So that's all I'll say about that. Um, <laughs> and then finally, these I think are the reform politics that are going on. They're dangerous. Um, to try to achieve equity and excellence, they're not helping. They're be ideologically driven. Um, electoral activism, we see the groups like Students First now entering into school board elections across this country. Um, CCSSO, my national organization, is completely shifting to the far right. Um, ALEC bills being developed at a national level and introduced in states all across this country, dangerous stuff. Um, we don't need model policies to drive what needs to happen in education. And so I just want to close by saying we can still turn all this around. Uh, as I say at the beginning, my hope lies with all of you. Our future leaders, you have to help us move beyond the ideology and bitterness and get back to the basics of working with educators and other stakeholders to improve our educational outcomes. And at the end of every day, I'm proud to be the top advocate for public education in our state. It means so much to all of us. It's still the great equalizer. It's the great last public endeavor that we have in America that is open to all, to every citizen. Public education proves that America is still the land of opportunity. And I know the support, I know the public education is great because it's a gift that I was given. It's a part of who I am and a part of what drove me to become an educator. And I know that we have a lot to lose if we don't preserve it. I just want to also just say, when we start out a lot of uh, activities, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And the final words in the Pledge of Allegiance are, and justice for all. I stood by my mom one day when she was in the Senate and during the pledge, and she was a state senator. She ended the pledge with the words, with the, after, and justice for all, with the words, someday. And I thought that was great, so I say that to myself all the time, sometimes loud, sometimes not. Um, <laughs> we do not have justice for all yet. And many things remain to be done. However, we also have a lot to be proud of and to celebrate. And on the day of the presidential inauguration, I saw a Facebook friend comment that the pundits were all talking about a historic inauguration, that of re-electing an African-American man to a second term as president of the United States. He remarked, however, that his son is four years old, and that is all he has ever known, having a president who happens to be African-American. And I know that being the first American Indian woman elected to statewide office has made it much easier for the next American Indian to win a statewide office. And I can tell that when I meet young Native American students that they start thinking that they can run for statewide office and maybe even President of the United States and win. And that's why our hope lies with the next generation. It always has. We must do our part to support them in all that they do when we ensure that each student is provided with an opportunity to receive a quality education, that is how we make the future better. And when they grow up, they will not have to follow the words and justice for all with someday. They'll be able to say today. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you so much, Superintendent Juno, for your electrifying challenge to us and for providing such an illustrative example of how to bring culturally relevant ideas into practice. The Harvard Graduate School of Education community, particularly the students and alumni of color, are proud that you're one of our own. Your accolades are many, your catalogs of firsts are awe-inspiring, but most importantly, you show that it is indeed possible to achieve justice for all today. Oh, thank you. And in honor of your wonderful career and the outstanding legacy that you are continuing, the Alumni of Color Conference 
would like to honor you with the Alumni Achievement Award. Oh, thanks. And now our newest Alumni Achievement Awardee <laughs> will take questions from the audience. Please be mindful of the time and that many in the audience would like the chance to engage Superintendent Juno in this forum. And keep questions to 30 seconds. I told them I'd talk all night if they let me, so. <laughs> microphones, let me move back to the microphone. Mm -hmm. Microphones are set up in the, center, in the center aisles. If you would please approach them in single file line and we will start questions accordingly. Superintendent, um, very inspirational. It's amazing what you've done in the state of Montana, so thank you for that leadership. The question I have, um, having spent 20 years of my life in Arizona, mm -hmm. how did you bring tribal leadership together around this and unite them, knowing that there's this intent to hold on to culture mm -hmm. and wanting kids to go on and possibly be acculturated, but also maintaining who they are and mm -hmm. where they came from? Uh, we invited them to the table. Uh, and really did, I mean, if I think about the essential understandings, we invited tribal people to the table and asked them, what do you want to, people to learn about you? I mean, it wasn't sort of, we're going to take this aspect or we want to know about this. They were able to define for themselves what it is that we were going to take out to the public. And things that, the, and when we still do curriculum and we do lesson plans and, le and resources, we still vet it with them. And we're like, is this appropriate? Do you want this out there? And if they say no, we don't do it. And so they are still the holder of their tribal knowledge. They get to decide what goes out from our office. And then we make connections with people at, at local schools as well. If they need guest speakers, we help broker those types of efforts um, around our school improvement efforts. It's tough. I mean, I go to the tribal councils and I get yelled at a lot. Um, but it is because they're frustrated with what's going on. And so we try to take it and tell them. I mean, I think meeting with them, and that's part of our community liaisons, have been able to develop a really robust relationship with them because they're there all the time telling them what's going on in the school. It's no longer sort of this hidden thing. We have the superintendents in our schools go over to the tribal council and present to them and have a dialogue with them so that they feel included as a part of what's happening in these reform efforts. And so, and, and get their input and their advice on what can happen and how can you make connections. One of our tribes actually paid for a truant officer to go into the school because they saw attendance and they start realizing attendance was important. So they help support some of those efforts that were going on. And I think uh, our big part is that we've been, we've invited them to the table. We asked their advice. We let them know how they can make connections. And then, um, you know, and I think a big part of our effort too has been trying to move beyond blame, shame, and guilt. We know that we have a tragic history and, and the history is not a happy one when we talk about it, but for everybody and all stakeholders involved, we say, let's move beyond blame, shame, and guilt. Stuff happened and it wasn't good. Um, and these are the facts. They're the facts. They're the truth about what happened, but it's none of our fault about any of that. Any of us living, that didn't happen as a result of our actions and we can make that better, but we have to move forward together. So first of all, I wanted to say thank you. I'm originally from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and so I, I see a lot of commonalities between Montana and Oklahoma. Um, what I'm wondering though is we in Oklahoma, we have Oklahoma City and mm -hmm. Tulsa, which are pretty big urban areas, mm -hmm. and then we also have the, the rural population. So I'm wondering how um, an initiative like this could work at a state level when you have such different areas. Mm -hmm. I think it's very similar of you know identifying and, and as, you mean for Indian Education for All or for Indian Student Achievement? Um, for Indian Education. Okay, Indian Education for All, I, and it would be a similar way. I mean, the essential understandings when I talked about that, that really was the impetus to so much of our work because it was tribal voices coming together and even though those concepts seem easy, you have to know a lot to really understand it. And so 
what they were telling us and, and what we, at least we came up with these common understandings, then we were able to package some things around it. And that's really been, ever, I mean, I think that really, it was brilliant on our part, even though we didn't know it at the time, of asking people what we should be talking about and then packaging those things around. But uh, I think no matter where you live, um, it depends on the context. Like we work in, in some of our larger schools and some of our larger schools are our best schools at integrating that content because they actually have resources. And our rural schools struggle a little bit more with actually integrating Indian education for all because they don't have the resources and they may have six teachers versus a department of teachers in our, our urban areas. And so um, it, we just take different approaches. We do a lot of different online learning that goes on. We invite people. We do regional trainings, and so it can get out depending on whether it's rural or urban, and, and just work with people where they are and try to bring them along, so. Um, what do you think me as like a student of uh, Boston Public Schools could do to help aid in like, you know, historical education mm -hmm. of like the youth in Boston Public Schools? Well, and I love working with students because they're asked the most truthful questions and the hardest <laughs> questions. Um, but it is, and I'll just talk about my student advisory board, and I think it's opportunities like that. Look for opportunities where you can engage people who are in power. It is vitally important. They need to hear from you. Like I said, students tell me when my ideas are lame. They tell me when they're good. And look for those opportunities where you can get engaged and then bring your voice to that. Um, you guys did a great job up here. And then sitting at the table, I mean, we've been, uh, my mom and I, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants because of people who came before me. But being able to walk through the doors of opportunity as they ap appear has been so important to me. Um, and when I visit with students, the main thing, you know, I get their advice, I get their input, and they actually came up with what's called I Pledge to Graduate in our state. You know, they were, we were in an advisory board meeting and they said, we've been talking about what students, what adult, every adult in our system can do, and what about the students? Where do we fit in? And so they said, we want to do a I Pledge to Graduate campaign. And they came up with this pledge, and not just us pledging, but finding someone significant in our life who signs the pledge with us and holds us accountable to that. And it's been great. There's student-led events all across our state where, where they either do it whole school efforts or the seniors take it or the freshmen take it. Um, and there are great stories that are coming out. One kid uh, who was in fifth grade took the pledge to graduate, and. The mother, her, his mother wrote to me after and said, my, my child actually presented me a picture with it, him holding his pledge to graduate and gave it to me for Mother's Day. And, but I think that is the true power of, of students being engaged. And so what I would say is just find ways that you can bring your voice to whatever table you're sitting at, whether it's at a school level, a classroom level, learn your history. Learn your history in an accurate way and start confronting people who are not telling the truth about what happened. Hi, thank you so much for your comments. Um, since I've been at the ed school, I've felt often that um, the role of culturally relevant pedagogy has been sort of pushed aside by standards-based reform. Mm -hmm. And I hear you talking a lot about the importance of accountability mm -hmm. and the importance of evaluation, and I'm wondering how you feel that that can be balanced so that we can still have culturally relevant pedagogy and high standards. Well, I, it's very important in our state, like I said, in the Common Core Standards, we made sure that that was integrated into the Common Core Standards so that when teachers are sitting together to start unpacking all of those and implementing it, that has to be a part of the discussion. And again, we'll have a companion guide that goes with it. But it's always an issue. I mean, the era of standardized testing um, has led us down the road. I think data's good. I love data, and I think that the one good thing that came out of No Child Left Behind was our use of data. Everything else, I think, has been really detrimental to our system and particularly when we're moving down the road of tying these test scores to teacher performance, very dangerous area to be in. Um, and that's why in our state we don't have waivers and we don't have race to the top because I refuse to go down that road. And I told Secretary Duncan, as long as this is a component of anything that you push out, we are not going to be eligible because we refuse to go down that road. It's an ideological and philosophical difference. And we leave the, I mean, what we do now is we put a framework together of evaluation and we use the in-task standards and so nationally standards and 
We're not dictating the tool that needs to be used. We're not saying the type of data. We leave those up to the local unions and the local boards to decide on the type of evaluation tool they're going to be. Accountability is huge. We do look at test scores, but we use it as a measurement of where school improvement is and where we need to focus our efforts and where schools are performing. They're doing great. We go learn lessons from what they're doing. But where we really need to focus in and get into the nitty gritty and then into the dirt with, with schools, that's where we focus and that's what the use of data is good for us. But as far as measuring performance, at least in Montana, we won't go there for a while, hopefully. Hello, how you doing, Madam, Super um, Madam Superintendent? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm so nervous. I'm in high school, and all you guys have like degrees, and this is, this, is, this is somebody in politics right here. It's very nerve-wracking. But, um, but my name is George. Um, I'm still in high school at Salem Academy Charter School. I know mm -hmm. you don't necessarily like charter schools, but I'm here to represent. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Are they giving you a good education? Yes, ma'am. Right, yes, ma Some of the greatest. That's all that matters. Which allows me to be in places like this, to mm -hmm. see people like you guys. And I had the honor of being on the steering committee. And um, I just want to give you a personal thank you for everything you said. It was just very inspiring in knowing that we have people like you in politics and education, believing in the new generation, people like myself. It was just, it was very humbling and very honoring at the same time. So I just want to thank you. And it gave me a personal challenge now that you said, like, you have a little bit of an issue with charter mm -hmm. kids. Like, when I see you in the future, I'm going to let you know, like, you remember right. me? <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is charter schools right here. So, All right. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you. I tell people, I'm like, I'm open to ideas, but you have to be very compelling on areas that I don't agree, but I'm willing to listen. But you better bring a compelling argument, so we'll hook up in the future and you can tell me what's going on. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Cynthia. Thank you very much for being here tonight and um, giving us, or gracing us with your words. Um, the Critical Race Theory Group here at school hosted a screening of Precious Knowledge on Thursday night. Um, and it was about in Tucson, Arizona, how they're um, eliminating the Mexican American Studies program mm -hmm. and in ethnic studies. And the idea was that it was anti American and all these other uh, not true statements. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> my question is if when you were implementing and pushing for um, Indian um, education, mm -hmm. if uh, you ran up against this narrative of it being anti American or creating divisions within. Uh, America, uh, Indian American students and those that are not, and if so, uh, what did you do to, to counter this narrative? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we are the opposite of that. Um, when I see those types of issues coming in, up in states, I was like, what is going on in this country? And it's those types of things I was talking about at the end, the ideological differences and the political rhetoric and where we're going in this country needs to end, especially around education. I mean, I realize that, yeah. <laughs> I realize that education is political, but as hyper-politicized as it's become, it's very scary. But yeah, we receive pushback. I mean, what we always were able to come back to, though, was our state constitution and say it's a constitutional obligation and it needs to be a part of our education system. So that's why it's like we were very lucky that we had that, that language. We were lucky we had uh, legislators who were willing to push that. Um, you know, we got why not Norwegian America education for all. We got why not French ed I mean, we got all of those questions. Um, but we just kept pushing it down the road. And what we did, once we received the funding especially, was able to create so many resources and get a, uh, a lot of people going along with us on that. And that it became really now, it's, it's and that's why I was like, it's amazing in just a few short years how integrated into the education system in our state it is into curriculum, into resources, into the learning that happens every day in classrooms that I don't think it can be taken away now. I think people would be very upset if we started moving in the other direction. In fact, more people come on board. Uh, I was just at our best practices conference. It's our seventh year of our Indian Education for All uh, conference. And we actually have non-Indians who give the keynotes now because they are the ones who need to educate their peers. and so. And they are not going to let it go away. And so it really is getting that critical mass of people engaged with you and moving it down the road and then getting high quality resources. And I think the rhetoric of our, our discussion around we're moving beyond blame, shame, and guilt, that has been a huge thing, that we don't go out and do professional development and point fingers at people. It's like, your ancestors, blah, blah, blah. You know, we don't do that. We say, here's the facts. This happened, and we're going to teach facts. And this is how it gets carried out. And, uh, but we've been very fortunate that we've had that constitutional language and that's how we were able to get it done. 
Uh, Superintendent Juno, thank you for coming to speak about Indian education and rural education here. And I want to thank the AOCC for inviting Ms. Juno to come. We've had a very good time with her. I'm from the Harvard <laughs> University Native American program. Um, I have a kind of a big question. As an alum now and as a, an awardee of a very nice award here at mm -hmm. Harvard, what can Harvard do to support the work that you do in Indian education, not just in Montana, but nationally, mm -hmm. and not just Indian education, but rural education? Mm -hmm. Well, start teaching it. I mean, you know, it is, <laughs> we, um, you know, I, I do get, I'm jealous when institutions like Harvard have the urban principalship and those types of programs because we need help. I mean, we are starting to have to make these rural principalships. We need leadership that are very good in these rural areas and in the context of Indian reservations and people, the leaders who come in there have to have that understanding if they're going to be successful. So we're having to build our leadership up because we have huge turnover. Um, people come to the communities, they are there for a couple of years and then they're gone. And so we are cons constantly having to do our leadership development um, and we're working with one of our local um, universities to sort of build that system, but it's difficult. Um, but we, I mean, when you have places like Harvard that are creating the future education thought leaders and on the ground people who are going to be leading this country's education system, I think it's vital that, that all of those issues come to bear. And you need to understand rural America. Um, because if you don't, I mean, the way of rural America, there goes the country. I mean, it really is the things that are developed there, the agriculture systems and people who are leaving those areas. It, it becomes vitally important to at least have some research around it. We would love to have research in our state. I mean, we're just doing all this without any real basis and we don't have time or energy to step back and really take a look at what it is we're doing and how it's impacting people. Um, and so those types of efforts would help too. But I think, you know, all universities, like I said, in our state, we're working with our teacher education programs, telling them that they need to get it integrated. But I think it needs to be integrated in all of our universities across this country. Because like I said at the beginning, if you don't understand the basis of this country in a factual and accurate and authentic way, how are you going to go out and teach students to become the leaders of tomorrow? We apologize, but this next question will have to be our last. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm a, a leader um, in the Boston Public Schools at a Boston Public High School, but um, the reason I'm here tonight is because I'm a Montana native. All from, right. <laughs> from Anaconda, Montana. We're everywhere. Very rural Montana, <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, and what I think is really interesting about you, and I've always followed you since you mm -hmm. first ran, is that so many people I know in Montana who are teachers mm -hmm. campaigned really vigorously mm -hmm. for you. Um, and to me, that's a really interesting dynamic. I think about you know the State Commissioner of Education mm -hmm. in Massachusetts or in other places. What do you think, what impact do you think it has been that so many teachers campaigned for you and supported your candidacy versus you being just an appointed leader mm -hmm. of a state education system? So the way our system is set up in this country, about a third of the commissioners of education or superintendents of education are appointed by boards, about a third are appointed by governors, and about a third are elected. Um, and I like the idea of being elected superintendent because it provides some tension between the governor and the education program. I mean, if the governor's appointing the commissioner, then everything's just the governor's idea all the time. Um, and the idea that you have to get the people's support to oversee public education is also very important to me. Um, so I like the idea that the superintendent is elected. As far as teachers getting engaged, it's hard to get teachers engaged in politics. Um, but I think they're there for me because I, they know I support them. They know that I will advocate fiercely for their right to collectively bargain if they choose to, for their right to have as much freedom to teach as they want to, um, and, and they understand that. And so, but I think the big part is that I support public school teachers and, and I speak out for them consistently uh, and the work that they do. And you know, I tell people no matter where they are, they show up day after day, despite the national rhetoric, despite No Child Left Behind attacking their professionalism. Teachers show up day after day to teach every student who walks through their door. And that parents send their most treasured possession to them every day for them to do. So it's sort of this 
dual accountability that they really need to enter into. But I think um, getting teachers engaged, and that's why I tell them, is like, education is political, and you need to be engaged. And so when I go out and speak with groups of teachers, I think they get that now, especially knowing what's going on around the country. Last weekend, I was in Idaho speaking at their state democratic dinner. I was the keynote because I was like the only elected Democrat in the entire state once I got there. Um, <laughs> they have no elected Democrats. And, um, and teachers were there just because of the attack they're under in their state and the idea that their elected state superintendent isn't, isn't uh, paying attention to their interests. But I believe that this position really is about public education, and so I continue to support them, and I think they get that, and so they support me. Thank you again, Superintendent Juno. Um, your revolutionary impact is very live, and we could not have envisioned a better way of beginning the AOCC 2013. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm sorry, but um, with all due respect, I know you said it was the last question, but I feel this incredible urge to ask. So I'm from Oakland, California, mm -hmm. and I'm a product of public um, education. Mm -hmm. And I just want to do a similar thing of what you've done to create a change in their community. Um, and what my, I just wanna have a brief idea of what you went through and the resilience you, and all the obstacles you had to face to create this change. Well, <laughs> that's a long answer. Um, but I think it is finding mentors. You know, I was able to have the ability to have my mother as a mentor, being involved in, what I eventually came, I mean, I never thought I'd run for superintendent. I never thought I'd run for anything in my life when I left here and was going on to teaching and do all those things. Um, but getting engaged when you can on, on issues that you care about, and that's why I think this was the perfect position for me because I wanted this job. I wanted to be superintendent of public instruction because I like education. I like the nexus of policy and politics and where that meets. And so, you know, once I decided that I might want to have, that I had an interest in it, I just start getting engaged in all kinds of things. And I think at the community level um, is probably the best place to start. Run for school board, get to know the system and, and get engaged with all those things. We need good people running schools in this country. And until we get people on school boards, that's, I always tell people that's where the real power in education is, is on school boards. And we need good people appointed. That's why, you know, the Rees of the world are getting involved with school boards because they know that that's where they can change the action. And so we do need a counter-revolution to make sure that we're getting good people elected to those positions. And that comes back to the idea that education is connected to politics. And so I would just say start getting involved on issues that you care about and speaking out. And you know, sometimes the loudest one wins. <laughs> I'm Matthew Shaw. I'm one of the two, three co-chairs with, I do this all the time. Two, I always do, I'm looking at two people, <laughs> yeah. so I do this. Um, I'm one of the three co-chairs of this year's Alumni of Color Conference with Lucia Morris and Suhail Sheikh. Um, we are really excited about this weekend's events. We invite you all to tomorrow's exciting workshops and panel discussions following two days, um, highlighted by Jeff Duncan Andrade's keynote address tomorrow morning at 10.45 a.m. and Rich Reddick's closing keynote address tomorrow afternoon at 4.15 p.m., both in this Ask With Lecture Hall. If you have not yet registered, we are set up. Um, <laughs> we are not? Registration now opens at 8 o'clock in the morning. And Elliot Lyman, if you're not registered, you can register and participate in all of the wonderful events of this AOCC. Please join us now for a reception honoring Superintendent Juno uh, across the street in Gutman Library, sponsored by Ask With Forms. We would like to thank um, Superintendent Juno, as well as Ask With Forms and the Harvard University Native American Program for assisting the Alumni of Color Conference in bringing her yeah, here. It's been great. Thanks. Thank you.